Well, we're going to read our text from Hebrews 11, and then we'll be going to the Old Testament for the story. And as I've been trying to do in each of these, I'm going to tell you the story, and then we'll have the lesson as to what we've learned or trust that we've learned. The verse is 31 in the 11th chapter, and it says, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. You'll notice here immediately that the only difference between Rahab and all who perished in the fortress of Jericho was faith. It was faith that made the difference. Rahab believed, and the rest of Jericho believed not. Rahab was saved. The rest of the inhabitants of Jericho perished. She received the spies, but she received them with peace. The others would not receive the spies, and they rejected them, and they perished. So you have the, the background, and you have the, the structure of the story already. But now we'll go to Joshua chapter 2, where the story takes place. And there's an awful lot of reading in order to read this entire story. So I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read portions of it. And I'll start in chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 1. We've already had the story of the fall of Jericho, so we'll omit the story of the conquest and the fall. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up upon them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. And we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we shall be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we shall be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us swear. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. And it tells how they went back and told Joshua what had happened. Chapter 6, we have the story of the conquest and how that just before they totally sacked the city and burned it and destroyed the inhabitants, the two spies returned to Rahab's house, saved her and her family, brought them safely to Joshua. 
I thought I wasn't going to read it all, but I didn't see any part I could leave out, so I read it all. I like to read it, number one, because it's the Word of God. And it's really what He says that matters. And number two, I like for you to hear it read so that when I tell the story, you'll know I'm not embellishing it, adding details that are not here. I don't try to do that excepting to put it in a language we can understand. And I couldn't decide this morning whether it was a posse that went out after the two spies or whether it was the police, and I decided it was the law. So I'm going to tell you the story of Rahab, and then we'll have the lessons. Joshua had crossed Jordan, leading the children of Israel, and they were camped on the west side of Jordan. As I described to you on Wednesday night, this was a very, very strategic place as far as the Canaanites were concerned because stretching northwest and southwest behind the fortress of Jericho were the two great valleys that led into the highlands or into the hill countries of Palestine. And it was this land that flowed with milk and honey that Joshua and the Jews, the Israelites, were to possess. But standing in the way was this, was this immovable object, this fortress, this military garrison by the name of Jericho, the city of Palms. It was strategically placed on the west side of Jordan for this very purpose, that the land should not be invaded easily by means of the fords. But Joshua had led a large host, and a warlike host indeed, because already they had fought several encounters and engagements in the land. Had they not defeated, as Rahab reminded them, the king of the Amorites, in fact, both kings? And had they not dealt severely with Sihon and Og? Well, these battle-scarred veterans were now camped on the west side of Jordan, and before them was this tremendous obstacle, this fortress that must come down. But it was an impregnable fortress, the walls so wide that houses were built upon the top of the wall, and a chariot with four horses abreast could ride around its perimeter. Garrisoned by armed and trained troops, a city that could be entirely shut up from within, Joshua camps, goes before the Lord, as we learned on Wednesday night, and had revealed to him the strange and mysterious battle plan by which this fortress would fall. They were to march round and round until it finally came down, and that's exactly what happened. But while they were in the process of making battle plans, Joshua calls for his spies. And I could just see this scene this morning as I was thinking about it before coming down here. Joshua calls in his spatially trained commando-type troops. And he says to them, All right, men, we have a dangerous mission. I'm going to ask for two volunteers. You must go understanding that it may very well be a suicide mission. I'm going to ask you to go inside the walls of Jericho. I'm going to ask you to spy out the fortress, find out the troop strength, and if there's any weakness in those walls, bring back that report. But I warn you this, we've had reports of the cruelty of the Canaanites to prisoners of war. If you get caught, name, rank, and serial number. That's all. You don't tell them how many there are of us, what we intend to do, or where we're camped. Two volunteers step forward. They're briefed on their duties, and they take off in the night. I imagine, because they were quite a little distance from Jericho, that they must have spent the night on the outskirts of Jericho and intended in the morning when the gates were opened and traffic passed in and out of those gates in the normal routine of business that they would slip in unattended, perhaps by a caravan coming down out of the north or up out of the south. And so finally when morning came and the gates had been opened and traffic began in and out of the gates of Jericho, the two spies slipped in. They did spy out the city and they did examine the walls and they did go about their duty spying out the troop strength but soon the night time was approaching and they decided they better try and spend the night in Jericho because just as soon as the sun went down, the gates were closed and they couldn't get out. So they decided they'd just pass the night there in the middle of this strange and scary kind of city. And so, if you'll let me use modern language, it makes it more intelligible to me. They looked for a motel. They had to have a place to stay, and they couldn't sleep in the streets. And as they walked along, they saw this big neon sign. It said, 
Rahab's Motel. <laughs> on the wall, five minutes from downtown Jericho. <laughs> Color TV. <coughs> reasonable rates. Fine restaurants. One spy said to the other one, this would be a good place to go. Now, there's another version of how they got into this motel or this inn where they spent the night. Josephus, and I don't know how much stock again to put in this man's word, but he recorded the history as it was handed down by tradition. And he said that it was Rahab herself who encountered the men on the street and led them to her inn. Anyway, they found this motel, this place to spend the night, and they sat down to eat their evening meal. But while they were in the course of this evening meal, the king had already discovered their presence in the fortress of Jericho. Now, there wasn't too much that went on in that place that he didn't know about. Because if Joshua had his spies, the king had his. And I kind of fancy that there were some undercover men who manned the gates by day and watched for suspicious persons coming and going. By the evening hour, the king had received a report of two suspicious persons known to be strangers and foreigners, not Canaanites, had found their way into the fortress, and the gatekeepers have informed him now that they have not left that fortress. So he immediately sends out troops. He learns that these men were last seen in the company of Rahab, and the troops are immediately dispatched to Rahab's motel to find out if these strangers are still on the premises. Now they came to Rahab's inn and challenged her to send them down. Before they could come into the inn, for she was on the wall, remember, she had time to warn the spies and hide them on a rooftop, which she did. She said, come on, I'm going to hide you. I've got a little place up on the roof and I've got some flax drying up there. You get up and I'll cover you up with the flax. And even if they search the house, they won't see you here. So she hurriedly took the two spies to the rooftop and they laid down flat on the roof and she covered them up with flax. She went down and opened the door to the soldiers. And I'm sorry I'm late, but I had some beans cooking, you know, and I just couldn't come to the door right away. Just come on in. Yes, I know about the two spies you're looking for. I did see them. They were here earlier in the afternoon and they did take their evening meal here. Well, do you have any idea where they went? Yes, I do. I heard them talking while they were eating. And they said they were going to leave, and I think they went on through the gate, and the last I saw them, they were going down I-77 south towards Ripley. <coughs> and it could have been a Western story, because she could have said they went that way. So that's what she did. She threw them off the trail. So she says, and if you'll hurry and, you know, bug on out of here, you can catch them, because they're just down the road a little ways. I saw them go. And they thanked her, and they gathered the troops up and out through the gates of Jericho they went. And they started to pursue these two spies who weren't going anywhere. And so they were chasing an imaginary enemy all the way down to the fords of Jordan and never did catch up with them. Well, in the meantime, back at the hotel or back at the motel, soldiers had searched the premises, but they didn't find the two spies. And so after the search party had departed and they had gone out into the, into the way leading out of uh, Jericho towards the fords of Jordan, and the gates were closed once more. She brings the spies down, and she says, now they're gone, and they're not going to suspect that you're still here, and I've got a way for you to escape. You know, my inn is here on the wall, and I'm going to let a big rope down over the side of the wall, and you can slide down that rope to safety, but when you get down on the ground, don't take the highway. Head for the mountains as fast as you can go. Stay in the mountains for three days, and you'll be safe, and then you can escape to your own people. Now I've dealt kindly with you. And I ask for kindness in return. I want to be saved. And I want my family to be saved. Tell us how we can be saved. We know about your God. And we know what a great God He is, and we know about His judgment upon this fortress. And... We want you to tell us how we can escape this pending judgment. And the spies said to her, All right, we will swear to you in an oath. When the Lord has delivered this fortress into our hands, 
you will be safe and all that find shelter in your home will be safe. And she said, give me an assurance of this. Give me some token of the truth. Give me some proof of the sincerity and the truthfulness of what you say. And one of the spies said, here, take this scarlet line, this scarlet cord, the same one that you let us down over the wall with. For I fancy from the words of this story that they were already on the ground talking up in whispered tones to Rahab on the wall. Take this same line and fasten it in your window. And before the destruction of Jericho takes place, we will search out the house with a scarlet line and you and your whole household will be saved. <coughs> That's a wonderful story. So they were let down over the wall and they escaped to the mountains and there they hid for three days and found their way finally back to their own troop position and reported everything to Joshua. So then the battle came, as you know, which wasn't really any battle, just the conquest of Jericho. And they came and walked around six days in a row. And on the seventh day, they walked seven times around the fortress. And they blew the trumpets and the people shouted. It was the shout of victory. But they shouted after Joshua gave the shout. And as soon as the shout of the people had taken place, the walls collapsed. And the Hebrew in this passage says that the walls totally and completely fell in. There wasn't a stone left standing upon another. And they fell definitely into the city. And the people marched in over the top of this stone uh, pathway, as it were. And <clears throat> the two spies that had been sent out and been hidden and dealt kindly with the Rahab were dispatched ahead of time by Joshua. Just as soon as they went into the city, these two spies went right to Rahab's motel and they delivered her and her family and brought them safely to Joshua, who undoubtedly was somewhere in field headquarters set up. And Joshua praised them and thanked them for taking care of the spies. And the scripture says, and so Joshua saved Rahab and her family. Then the city was destroyed. It was burned with fire, clear to the ground. Everything, everything was demolished. The city was left in ashes. And every man, woman, boy, and girl perished at the edge of the sword. Josephus said that the Jewish soldiers went up and down the streets of Jericho, slaughtering the people. The city was strewn with dead bodies. The streets ran in blood. Rahab and her family were safe outside Jericho in the presence of Joshua. Now, that's the story. And I note here that uh, in the sixth chapter of Joshua that the writer of Joshua says that Rahab still lives in Israel. Says she still dwells in Israel to this very day. And I did a little research on Rahab and found out that she was a great great grandmother of King David. And she was one of the ancestors of our Lord Jesus Christ after the flesh. Josephus always gives a little colorful uh, clue that we don't get other places. He said that she came back and fell in love with Joshua and became his wife. Don't sinners saved by grace become the bride of Joshua? I don't know whether she did or she didn't, but it makes a good story. And the rabbis said that she became the mother of eight prophets and priests and became one of the most illustrious women in the nation of Israel. So now we have to use our spiritual types and we have to find out what lessons are here to learn. And there are some precious lessons and more probably than we'll get assimilated this morning. But first of all, Joshua in this story is the type of the Lord Jesus. Now I told you last Wednesday night he was a type of the Holy Spirit. But last Wednesday night we had the conquest of Jericho. And it was how the Holy Spirit <clears throat> working in and through God's people destroyed the fortresses that stood in the way of our walk in the land with God. Now this story doesn't have anything to do with God's people. This has to do with Joshua's attitude toward those under judgment. So it has to do with Jesus' attitude toward sinners. Joshua becomes the type of the Lord Jesus. Why, the very Greek transliteration of the word Joshua is Jesus. So we can't make him anything else excepting Jesus, the friend of sinners, the Savior of sinners. What a wonderful story it is because the whole story 
is the story of Jesus and this poor woman who lived in the city of Jericho. So Joshua becomes a type of the Lord Jesus. And the first thing I'd like to tell you about Jesus and this woman that might encourage your heart is the fact that the Lord Jesus, who is the Savior of sinners, knows where every sinner is, and he knows who every sinner is. And if there's a sinner any place, even if they are locked up in the fortress of Jericho, even if he has to sneak in by stealth, he will send messengers to that sinner if he wants more light than he has. And that's an encouraging word. <coughs> if there's a sinner anywhere in the fortress of Jericho held by the God of this world within his locked walls, living in a place of condemnation and judgment and awaiting the coming wrath of God, any sinner that will walk in the light he has and believe the little bit of truth he possesses and desires to be saved from that place can be saved because Jesus knows where he is and he'll send somebody in after him. Now believe that. I see it here and I see it throughout the Bible. Jesus indeed loves sinners. In the fourth chapter of John, when he sat down on the curbstone of Jacob's well with the woman of Samaria, he came there deliberately. He didn't accidentally pass by that well. It says in the very beginning of the fourth chapter of John that Jesus made the statement, I must needs go by the way of Samaria. He didn't have any call to travel that way. He had need to go there because at that well, at that moment of time, there was to be a poor woman lost and living in trespasses and sins who needed to meet Jesus and who wanted to meet Jesus and who for a long time had believed what she had read in the Scriptures about Him who had been promised to sinners. He planned His journey to be at the well of Samaria at noontime. And He planned the affairs of His day that He might stop at that well and save that poor woman. And I see the same thing in the story of blind Bartimaeus who stood on Jericho's road. And it says, And Jesus passed by. But he didn't just pass by accidentally. He came that way because in all that crowd there was but one soul who cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he heard him above every human being in that crowd. And even though there was a large press came and gathered around him when he was teaching and preaching, Probably a crowd multi uh, multiplied hundreds in this crowd. At one time he preached to 5,000 men, not counting women and children. There must have been a crowd of hundreds and hundreds of people pressing about him. But one poor sinful woman who touched the hem of his garment made contact with him. And this ought to be an encouraging word for any unsaved person. I believe he traveled clear across the Sea of Galilee and deliberately stopped in the region of the Gadarenes that he might save that demon-possessed man. And I believe that he chose the road he traveled the day Zacchaeus was in the sycamore tree because there was a little man hidden in the foliage of the tree, hidden from everyone but Jesus. And Jesus knew who he was and he knew what he was, greatest sinner in all the town, biggest thief and liar that ever walked the streets of his city a social outcast and hated even by his own neighbors and friends. He was a sellout. He was a traitor. He had betrayed his own people to become tax collector for the Romans. And he was despised and hated for he was a crooked, slimy, silver-tongued politician. But what the world did not see was down in Zacchaeus' heart a desire to be saved. You can't tell what's on the outside of a man. And you can't tell what's on the outside of a woman. And here was Rahab, who had a desire to walk in the light she had and to believe the truth had been revealed to her. And it all burst forth in that one night when, in the presence of these two witnesses, she suddenly became aware that she had made contact with the God she believed in. Jesus knows where every sinner is, and he'll send somebody to get him. He sent Peter all the way to Caesarea, Caesarea because of Cornelius the centurion. 
who gave alms and prayed. It was the only religious thing he knew to do in order to be saved, but it wasn't enough. He needed to hear the gospel. And Jesus sent Peter all the way up there on a long, dusty journey to tell him words whereby he and his household might be saved. And he sent Paul all the way into Macedonia, even though Paul didn't want to go, to find a single man who was asking God for grace. And Paul never found that man until at the midnight hour in the Philippian jail. He heard in his voice the reason he had come to Macedonia. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul had the glorious privilege of announcing Jesus to him, preaching the crucified Redeemer. Jesus knows where the sinners are. And if you say you want to be saved and Jesus won't save you, you lie. If you say you want to be saved but God doesn't even know you're alive, you lie. He knows who you are and He knows where you are. He knows what you are. And He knows whether you want any more truth than you have. And He knows whether you want any more light than you now possess. He'll give you as much as you want. He'll give you nothing if nothing's what you want. But He'll storm a fortress. He'll sneak two spies in the night. He'll leave no stone unturned, literally, as He did in the fortress of Jericho to save you. And if He has to batter the walls of your prison down, He'll do that. But no man, no woman, no boy or girl will perish in this world wanting more light than He had or desiring more truth than he knew. Didn't the spies say to her, if a man abide in his house, he'll be safe. If he spurns this house, if he chances on the street, his blood will be on his own head. He could have been saved had he desired it. Salvation is by grace, and grace is upon every man. The very fact that God has allowed you to live until this present moment of time is the abounding grace of God. You deserved hell the moment you drew your first breath. You came into this world lost in sin, conceived in sin, born in iniquity, going astray, speaking lies from your mother's womb. God has preserved you until this present moment, ministered to you, drawn you here by divine appointment to this hall to hear the gospel. There will be enough grace manifest here in this message this morning to save you and to save every inhabitant in the fortress of Jericho if they would want to be saved. Jesus knows where the sinners are and he wants to save them. And I call to your attention, in case I overlook it in the telling of the story, that it was Joshua who saved her. And it says in the sixth chapter, So Joshua saved Rahab and her family. Well, it seems like the spies really saved her, but they didn't. It was Joshua who saved her. Well, how can that be? Well, it was because the spies were only acting on his orders. They had no authority in themselves to save Rahab. Only Joshua had the right to say who would live and who would die in the city of Jericho. They were ambassadors for Joshua. They were his ministers. They were his messengers. They were his servants. And they were dispatched there by Joshua himself to preach the gospel that saved Rahab and her family. Oh, they got no glory for what happened. It was Joshua who got the glory. They were not brought to the spies when they were delivered. They were brought to Joshua. It was Joshua who saved them by grace through faith. Spies took no glory and sought none. They acted only by the right and the authority and the power of Joshua himself. Two little items I like about this matter. Two is the number of testimony. And there was two spies Joshua sent. And I like this also. Joshua himself was an experienced spy. You remember 38 years before when the children of Israel were camped at Kadesh Barnea and Moses sent spies into the land? Caleb and Joshua were the leaders of those spies. And Caleb and Joshua were the only ones who believed that the land was truly theirs. What does it mean? Well, if Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus, then we hear his words as he commissions these two spies to go into Jericho. As my father sent me, so send I you. 
Jesus never sends me any place. He hasn't been there before. He didn't ask me to do anything. He hasn't already done. He didn't ask me to take a single risk. He hasn't already taken for me. He won't put me in danger unless he's tested that danger first. Oh, I like that. He was the first great spy. He came into this fortress of this world long before he sent us out into the world. He came into this world and spied out the land. He's the only man that ever lived that went back and reported to God that the land was his and could be taken by the power of God. He's the only one that came into this land of traffic. That's what the word Canaan means and brought a good report back to God. He had to have some vision the common people didn't have and Caleb and Joshua had that vision and Jesus had it too for he saw the human race and all of its sin and misery. He saw it through the blood of sacrifice which he intended to make himself. And now he sends us to the same hostile world into the same fortress into which he came with the same message that God loves sinners and will save anyone inside those walls who wants to be saved. So, Joshua, I think, is fairly established as a type of Jesus. And Rahab can't be anything but the type of the sinner. Now, we have to find out, first of all, who Rahab was. Now, you got your seat belts buckled? <coughs> I'm going to tell to you just like it is. It says in the scriptures that Rahab was a harlot. That's an old-fashioned word for prostitute. And there's a more vulgar word, and it's used over and over in the Bible. Rahab was a whore. Now, nothing wrong with that word, because it's used over and over in the scriptures, and that's exactly what a prostitute is. Well, you've heard me say many times that isn't so, because it says that Rahab was really an innkeeper. And I was told this by a competent Bible authority one time. That she was not a harlot at all, but she was an innkeeper. And innkeepers were considered by the translators of the King James Bible to be harlots. And so they naturally translated harlot instead of innkeeper. And I believed that for a long time up until this week. Now I'm here to tell you what I do believe. On a word more sure than the Bible expositor. In the book of Hebrews, verse 31, the, the text which I read here this morning, the scriptures say, Rahab the harlot. And so I thought to myself, well, the King James translators have added that word harlot or replaced the word innkeeper with it because of their prejudice and bias against women hotel keepers. And so I was about to pass over it, and the Lord said, you better check and see. So I did, and I found out that the word used by the Holy Spirit to describe Rahab is the word in the Greek, porne. And it comes from a root word, pornos, and is the basis of our word, pornographic. And it is literally translated, whore. You know what pornographic means? It means the writing of a whore. The memoirs of a prostitute. That's the literal translation of the word pornographic. So, I'm here to straighten up that little point with you. Rahab was indeed a harlot. And why not? Is she not a type of a sinner? Joshua never came to Jericho to save good people. He came to save the chief of sinners. And the chief of sinners was a woman, and her name was Rahab. You laugh when I tell you this, and I can't help it because I didn't make this joke up. You want know the word Rahab means? You want to laugh? <laughs> Broad. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just what it means. Rahab was abroad. <laughs> she was a harlot. She was a prostitute. That was her trade. That was her business. And I'm going to tell you what prostitution is. Because I don't think the word is getting defined too much anymore. And I think a lot of young people are growing up thinking these words are so old-fashioned because the sins don't exist anymore. 
And somehow we don't see sin as we once saw it. Times are changing. Social trends have just about wiped sin out of our existence. A little bit remains is being explained away by the psychiatrists and psychologists. Some will tell you what a harlot is, what a prostitute is, what a whore is. It's any woman or man who sells their body for hire. It may not be for two dollars or five or ten. It may be for popularity. It may be for acceptance in the in crowd. It may be for a reputation. It may be for a good time. It may be for a number of benefits. But a prostitute is a person who peddles their flesh, who gives their bodies to others for pleasure, for recompense in return. <coughs> and for this, the judgment of God is not only upon the sin, but the sinner who engages in it. And even though society doesn't believe it anymore, and the moral standards of this society in which we live laugh at the idea, harlotry is one sin upon which the severest kind of judgment is passed in God's work. So Rahab was that kind of person. She was a cute little trick who peddled her body to the men who came along in the city for a price. Oh, she sold meals and furnished rooms too along with it. That's always a sideline. But she was a professionally pray paid woman of the night. That's an old-fashioned phrase. And uh, this lends more credence to Josephus' story that it was Rahab who sought the men out on the street and who perhaps solicited them. Oh, I don't think she came up and said, you know, I think she came up and said, you fellas looking for a place to stay? We have a good restaurant on the wall, five minutes from downtown Jericho, heated pool. Or maybe she was standing on the wall as they walked by, and she said, you fellas looking for a place to spend the night? Come on up. Well, someone said one time, if that were really the truth, it doesn't say much for the spies. Oh, it does. It says an awful lot for the spies, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. It says an awful lot for the spies. Let me say it now in case I forget it. That was the very woman Jesus sent them there to get. And there isn't any other way to get her except going after her. You don't think she's going to run out and run down to where Joshua is, do you? She has to hear something about Joshua first. She has to find out how to be saved first. I'm fed up with the kind of churchianity that wants to preach from an exalted pulpit all of its time. Sinners get saved by Christians rubbing elbows with them. I'm not advising the men to go to houses of prostitution. But I'll tell you one thing, if Jesus sent me there, I'd go in. I went in one time in the old Monroe Hotel. I don't know whether my reputation ever survived or not. And I'm not very handsome, but the girls chased me clear to the eighth floor. <laughs> but there was a man back there at the end of the hall that called me on the telephone in tears and said, I want to be saved. And I can't get out of this hotel because I can't pay my bill. And I don't suppose you'd come in this place, but I don't know how to get out. And I went in and I got him and we both got out. And if somebody saw me going in now there, they can say what they want to. When Jesus sends me someplace, I don't give a who what you think about it or anybody else. George was sending them into Jericho. They went. And I know they were led to that place. And we'll tell you a little more about it after a while. Why do you think she was so impressed with these two men? I'll tell you why she was impressed with them, because they weren't just two ordinary men that walked off the street into her establishment. They came to show her a more excellent way. <coughs> Something the poor woman had never had offered to her by a man before she had offered in the form of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> All right. Rahab was a harlot. She was an innkeeper. That was a part of her business. And I'm here to tell you some good news. 
Jesus can save whores. But they have to want to be saved. And they have to believe that Jesus has the power to save even a scarlet woman. He has a scarlet that's greater than the scarlet sin of that woman. It is the blood which he shed at Calvary. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. It can go into a whorehouse and save a mistress from its midst. It can go into a jail and save a hardened mercenary soldier. It can take a centurion who crucified the Lord of glory himself and make him open his mouth in awe and wonder and say, Truly, this was the Son of God. Jesus can save a demon-possessed man. He can save a Mary Magdalene possessed of seven devils and once a woman of the street herself. He can save a woman from Samaria who had had five husbands and now living in sin with a man who was not her husband. He can save a murderer dying on the cross who cries out, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He didn't come to save good people. He came to save sinners. He didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. He came to call those who dare not lift their heads in the presence of God, but bow in shame and cry, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He didn't come to save the good church people of Parkersburg. He came to save the down and the out, the sinners lost and know that they're lost, walking in what little light they have, living in what little bit of truth they've had. He came to search in Jericho until he found a harlot or a murderer or a drunkard or a thief. And if you can't see yourself as bad as any of these, you're going to have a hard time getting saved at all. Oh, I don't think you have to do all these things in order to qualify for salvation. You just have to hear what God says about your own heart and tell you that in your heart you have the potential to do all these things and may very well do them before you die unless Jesus saves you. I hear people talk about what God saved them from. And they always make reference to my past sin, they say. Oh, I was a drunkard, or I was this, or I was that. And they boast and say, I'm glad God saved me for that. I'm glad too. Some of us can't look back, perhaps, and say, I was a drunkard, I was a thief, I was a murderer, I was a harlot. So you look back, and you read the first three chapters of Romans, and every wicked, vile, filthy thing in those three chapters is what God saved you from. You have double reason to thank God for what he saved you from. Some of us experienced a portion of it. You should thank God he saved you even the experience of some of those more severe and terrible things which are reported in those three chapters. Sure he saved Rahab from a life of harlotry. He can save you young girls here this morning from ever experiencing that kind of life. And you have double reason to thank him and to praise him. He can save harlots. He can save anybody. He transformed this woman. He made her a new creation in himself. I'll tell you why this woman was chained. She was made a new creation in Jesus Christ. The proof of it is here. He wasn't ashamed to own her as his own ancestor after the flesh. Nor was he ashamed to come by the line of Rahab when he entered into mankind. What grace. Jesus not ashamed to call her his sister. Made her a mother of prophets and priests. The great, great grandmother of the most illustrious king who ever reigned, King David. Blessed her by making her a part of the Lord's earthly family. That's what grace can do. I'm glad Rahab was a harlot. I'm glad because it gives every sinner hope. We might have left you with the impression that she sa uh, he saved Rahab because she was not a harlot and was a little better than the common women of Jericho. She was saved because she was a cut below the women of Jericho and knew it and wanted to be saved by the grace of God. Okay, now we find out who she was and tell you where she was. She's in Jericho. Jericho, the city of palms. Walled city with gates. Land of the Canaanites. And the word Canaan or Canaanites means traffic or traffickers. 
And in this place she was abiding. And this place was under the curse of God. For when Joshua took the fortress, he pronounced God's curse upon everyone and everything in that fortress. That's the reason God dealt with Achan so severely, because he saved that wedge of gold and hid it in the floor of his tent from Jericho. It was under the curse of God, it was under the pending judgment of God, and it was awaiting the poured out wrath of God. She was a sinner. And she was abiding in the place of death under the curse of God and had nothing more to look forward to than the judgment and wrath of God. And that's where every unsaved man, woman, boy, and girl is this morning. They're dwelling underneath the pending wrath of God. He that believeth not is condemned already, for he hath not believed on the name of the Son of God. At the end of that third chapter of John, from which I've just quoted, he says that if you have not the Lord Jesus Christ, the wrath of God abideth on you. And Rahab was a very fortunate sinner because she recognized where she was and she recognized what she was and she was not too proud to ask for help. And I think it's strange that she's the only person in the fortress that did ask for help because there wasn't anybody in there except Rahab who really believed that fortress was ever going to come down. But Rahab believed because she had had previous to the visit of the spies a revelation of the true God. And we're going to talk about that. She knew where she was, all right. If she had any eyes to see from her place on top of the wall, she could look out and see the judgment of God building up in strength as the Israelites poured over Jordan and began to set their tents up. She saw the handwriting on the wall and she saw the coming judgment of God and the writer of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 31, our text this morning, says that it was by faith she perished not, <clears throat> which means that she believed something. It means that she believed something that she had already heard. <clears throat> Pardon me. And what had she heard? Well, it tells us here in the 11th verse. As soon as we had heard these things, and the things are in the 10th verse, reports had already filtered through to the fortress of Jericho about the miracle of the Red Sea. She had already heard how God had used the Israelites to deal with the two kings of the Amalekites, or the Amorites. And she had also heard what had happened to Sihon and Og. These kings got dealt with severely at the hand of Joshua and his people. So someone had already carried reports to, Joshua, to Jericho, and Rahab had heard them, and they had had a tremendous effect upon her heart, not her head. And I think this 11th verse is a wonderful verse to describe what true conviction really is. Number one, she said, when I heard these things, my heart melted. And number two, there wasn't any courage left in me. And it was all due to the fact that she had learned something about the Lord, their God. Now, here's a strange thing. I don't know how much to make of it, but... The Holy Spirit here quotes Rahab. And in her words to the spies, she said <clears throat> that she had heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Red Sea, and the word Lord in the Hebrew is the word for Jehovah. Now just hold that for a minute. And that name was only revealed to the Jew. It was a very special name which he took upon himself in relationship to the nation of Israel. But before she's finished in her conversation, she has not only referred to God as Jehovah, she also refers to him as Elohim, which is his creator name. 
And the point I'm trying to make is that before the spies arrived on the scene, she had already had enough light and enough truth to know that Jehovah was the creator. And she feared him, which I think is the simple definition of conviction, the fear of God upon our hearts. Not trembling for the fear of hell and judgment, but an awesome sense of reverence settling down upon the heart in the realization that we have sinned against the Creator, the Jehovah of the Jewish nation, and the Lord God, as she names him here, of heaven and earth. And that conviction had settled upon her soul long before the spies got there. You with me? Romans 1, you still with me? She had learned by the creation around her, by the testimony of others who had known this Jehovah and Lord God, she had known that he was the creator, that she was a poor, sinful, lost woman, and she wanted to know how to be saved when he dealt with her civilization in judgment. That's what she knew before the spies got there. What she didn't know and that's why the spies had to go, was how to be saved. She needed the gospel preached to her. She had to have the gospel preached to her. And that's precisely what these spies were doing inside the city walls of Jericho. She asked them how to be saved. She said, I know that God's going to give you this fortress. Let me put it in spiritual language. I know judgment is coming. I know God's not only going to deal with me, He's going to deal with everyone in this civilization. I know that I must face the pending wrath and judgment of God. I know this. I believe it because I know that he has dealt thus in the history, in the past, with others. The Red Sea, the Amorites. And I don't want to perish. I want to be saved. I believe Jehovah is the Lord God of heaven and earth. But somehow it leaves me lacking. I want to be saved and I want the assurance that I'm going to be saved. I want a token. Septuagint says, I want a token of truth. I want something I can hold on to. I want something that's going to see me through the fall of the wall. I want something that's going to see me through the terror of those last few hours when those Israelites are marching around that city and I know it's coming down. I want something that will keep me through those night hours when the city is filled with fear. When every other inhabitant of this of this fortress lays down at night and cries and is afraid. I want something that will give me peace. I want something that will hold me steadfast. I've got to have a token. That's what she asked for. And that's exactly what she got. Here's the gospel they preached to her. Verse 17 and 14 and then 17 to 20. <clears throat> Verse 14 says, And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be that when the Lord hath given us the land, we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And those words touched my heart. Because kindly and truly are two words that describe all of Jesus' dealings with sinners. He deals kindly with them. What did he say to the woman that was taken in the very act of adultery when the Pharisees dragged her before him? He said after the Pharisees convicted in their conscience one by one had gone, he turned around and he said, Woman, where are thine accusers? She says, No man accuses me. And he says, Neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. If it's one thing the sinner doesn't need, he doesn't need to be condemned and criticized for his sin. <clears throat> he needs to be brought to Jesus where he will be dealt with in kindness and truly. For Jesus can demonstrate to him that he is the friend of sinners, not the enemy. That we should feel safe and at peace in his presence, not trembling and afraid. You know, church people today are scared to death of sinners. They don't want to see them, don't want to touch them, don't want to rub up against them, don't want to associate with them. They want to pay the preacher to be a huckster. They want him to stand in the pulpit and then they can bring the sinners in. They don't have to sit with them, but they can at least bring them in and their paid soul winner will do the job of doing whatever it is that has to be done with them. 
The church was never a soul-winning station. Read the New Testament. It was a place where the saints gathered around the Lord Jesus Christ to be built up in the faith. The soul winners were men and women, ministers of the ministry of reconciliation, ambassadors of Christ, who went out in the open marketplaces and up and down the streets and in and out of the heathen temples and into the synagogues and into any place there were sinners and befriended them for Jesus' sake and became, as Paul said, all things to all men in order that he might win some. You win some, you lose some. You get rained out on others. But if you're going to win sinners to Jesus, you're going to have to go where sinners are. The church expects them all to come to them. They will not because churchianity doesn't have anything to offer to the sinner. They don't have any reality. They don't have any good news to preach. They don't have any positive transformation in their lives. They don't have anything but a dead creed, doctrine, and dogma. And the sinner's been joined to too many things already. He don't want to be joined to some religious organization. The sinner needs to meet up with a real, live, honest-to-goodness, breathing, walking, living Christian who's not trying to drag him to church or proselyte him or convert him to something, but who's out there walking around in the world loving and living the Lord Jesus Christ and not asking anybody for anything, but ready to give to all who ask, what must I do to be saved? The world needs to see some Christians in whose lives there is some reality to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not afraid of sinners. I think if we love Jesus and we're saved and we catch anything of the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't help but love sinners. We can't help but want to associate with them in whatever degree we can in order to win them. That must be our first and basic relationship to them, to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't use it as an excuse to run with sinners and enjoy their sin. Jesus ran with sinners, but he was never accused of being one. He befriended every harlot, thief, and drunk in town, and they even nicknamed him friend of sinners. That's what you are. And the Pharisees looked down their nose at him because he'd dare have anything to do with the unclean. If he hadn't braved and risked his reputation by talking with Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene would have gone to hell. And if he hadn't risked being seen in public with a woman of Samaria, she would have died and gone to hell. And if he hadn't risked associating himself with a dying, thieving murderer on the cross of Calvary, he would have died and gone to hell. That's what it's all about. Kindness and truth is the only way Jesus deals with a sinner. And he does not condemn us for our sins. He died to save us from our sins. And kindness is the key to his dealing with the sinner. You don't need to go to some old drunk and say, Shame on you, shame on you, you old sot. Do you know you're ruining your health? Oh, tell him something he doesn't know. He knows he's ruining his health. He knows he's ruining his family. He knows he's ruining his soul, his heart, his mind, and everything about him. Tell him about Jesus who loves him in spite of him being a, a wicked drunk. Tell him that there's a Savior that loves drunks. There's a Savior that loves harlots. A Savior that loves murderers and thieves. I spent seven years in the penitentiary doing that. And that's the reason the preachers don't brave that place, because they don't have anything to tell anybody. It's Jesus will save you to come to church and contribute to the collection plate and join the rolls and get active in the program and be a good man and live the right kind of life. That's the message. Oh, Jesus doesn't have any gospel like that. He has genuine good news for sinners. It is, number one, I love you, and I'm going to deal with you in kindness. And anything I tell you, you can believe, because when I deal with you in kindness, I'm going to deal with you in truth. And these spies promised her that Joshua would deal with her in kindness and he would deal with her in truth. That means he will not hide her sin by sweeping it under a rug and saying she's not a harlot and didn't do anything wrong. <coughs> he will take her just as she is and for what she is. And that's why we sing that song and that's why I love it, just as I am, without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. You mean Joshua want me to come? I'm a harlot. Joshua doesn't care what you've been or what you are. What he cares about is 
is that you want Him and He wants you. And He'll take care of the past and the present and the future. Harlan has a hard time living down a reputation. But you can do it when Jesus saves you. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you an example. The woman from Samaria, she was a town prostitute. She had a reputation. A reputation so great Jesus himself had heard it. Five men and now living in adultery with another. Selling her body to every Tom, Dick, and Harry come down the road. And as soon as she was saved, she spun gravels going back to Samaria. And the scripture says that she went to the men of the city. Did you ever read that? And she told them, come see this man I've met. She brought them to Jesus. And she brought this whole bunch of men from the city of Samaria out to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture says in that chapter that many believed on him because of her testimony. I tell you, you get a prostitute saved and that house of fame got some hard sled in the head. I went with a man one time. The man I helped get out of prison. A man who'd had a bad, hard, mean, miserable, ungodly life. And he called me up one day and he said, I have some errands to run. You want to go with me? And I said, yes. He said, I want to go tell the policeman that arrested me how Jesus saved me. And I said, fine. And we went and he did. He got back in the car and he said, I've got another stop to make. He said, will you come with me? I said, wherever it is. He went down to a very bad section of town, to a very bad house in a very bad section of town. And I said, we going in there? <laughs> he says, well, you can wait in the hall. And he walked in the front door and called for the woman of the house, and she started down the stairway, and she got halfway down, and he told her about Jesus. I believe in that kind of salvation. In a demon-possessed man having the demons cast out of him and going back to his friends in Gadara and tell them what great things the Lord had done for him. That's the way the gospel is preached. By a living, walking demonstration of transformation. And you may have a hard time living down your reputation as a harlot or whatever your particular vice is or whatever's got you the reputation you have. But it can be done. Because when Jesus saves you, when you see your old friends, you won't be the same person. It won't be just a lot of mouth service. It won't be a lot of talk. You have a new heart. And you'll be transformed inside. And the cleanness that has come inside will soon be apparent in the outside. If you're a prostitute, you quit dressing like you used to showing your body off to every man that comes along. You don't have to work in a house they'll fain to be a prostitute. You know, you can prostitute your body by sight. When Jesus saves you, you put some clothes on and you look like Jesus saved you. You may even smell like Jesus saved you, let alone act like Jesus saved you. And somebody may be impressed and they may say, what happened to you? And then you'll be able to say, Jesus saved me. I was blind, and now I can see I was lost, and now I'm found. I lived in Jericho once, and he tore the walls down, and he let me out. I was demon-possessed, and he cast them out. I was crippled, and he made me walk. I was dead, and he raised me. That's the way that gospel's preached, not with a lot of fancy words or fitting scripture verses together or passing out tracts. The gospel's preached by the reality of a new life in Jesus Christ. So, he said he'll deal kindly and truly with you. But there's only one way you can be saved. It is by this scarlet thread. You must put your confidence and trust in this token. All you have is my word. Hang that thread out and it will see you through the judgment. Hang that line from your window and your house on the wall and it will see you through the Holocaust that's coming. I know it sounds foolish, but you trust this token and you'll be saved. 
What did he give her? The same scarlet line by which she let him down over the wall. And may I comment here in case I forget this through the message? The spies and the harlot were both saved by the same rope. Why was it a scarlet rope? Well, what was it actually? I don't know where they got this word thread. And I'm not going to enter the debate of whether it was the same line or it wasn't the same line. I think that's what the spies meant when they said, hang this line by which you've also let us down over the wall in your window. I think it was the same rope. And it was made of scarlet threads, but they were all plaited and woven together to make a stout rope. And it's interesting how the scarlet dye was obtained. There was a worm nicknamed the scarlet worm. He was really a maggot type thing. And he lived in a particular kind of tree. And uh, they were very valuable because men searched for them when they found them in the tree. They took them and they crushed them. And when they crushed them, they produced a scarlet dye of great quality. It was used not only in clothing and tapestries and that type of thing. It was used to dye the rope and other things around the house. Now that's, that's interesting, you hold what you have, because in Psalm 22, when Jesus speaks from the cross of Calvary by prophecy, praying to God his Father, and he's dying out, beginning with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He says, I am a worm and no man. And I looked it up once in the Hebrew and found out that that worm he called himself was the scarlet worm. He was the scarlet worm that was to be crushed when taken from the tree. That out of his crushing might come the scarlet of redemption, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's significance to this rope, this line. It wasn't by coincidence that it happened to be scarlet and dyed by the worm that was crushed and gave his life that the dye might color that line. It was a type of his blood shed for sinners. It's a type because the spies said you can't be saved away from or apart from it. You can't be saved without it. There's nothing else that will deliver you. They could have left her a sword, but it isn't by sword that men are saved. They could have left her a secret route of escape, but it isn't by running that sinners are saved. They left her a token of truth. They left her an assurance, a symbol of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that shielded under that blood, hidden behind that blood, dwelling within the safety of that blood, is the only possible means of being saved from the judgment of God to come. So they left her with a scarlet line. And he put the personal responsibility on every person in her household to cast themselves upon that line in true faith. He said, if anyone comes into this house and abides where that line is found, they shall be saved. If he goes out onto the street... His blood will be upon his own head in the day that judgment comes to this fortress. Blood is set before all of us this morning, brethren. You can flee to the house of blood for safety and you'll never be harmed in the day of judgment. You can chance it on the streets where some of you are living this morning. Living in the streets. But your blood will be upon your own head in that day when Joshua comes to deal in judgment with you. This was a part of the gospel that they preached. And she had a responsibility to tell this to her family. And she also had an assurance. That assurance was the line, the rope, the scarlet thread. Now you want to hear Rahab preach? Okay. The spies are gone. And the book of Hebrews says she believed them. She had faith. She has the rope. She immediately, according to Joshua 2, hung it out of her window. <coughs> he comes a family home from work. Dad worked over to Visco's. He came home carrying his lunch pail. So what's that rope hanging out of the window for? <coughs> she says it's only a symbol. It's only a token. It's only a reminder. A reminder of what? The promises of God. And then she told me the gospel. Oh, I heard at the mouth of two witnesses today. And I was saved. What do you mean saved? 
I mean that judgment is going to come one of these days, but it's not going to touch me. How do you know that? I've been assured by the Word of God. I'm saved, Dad, and I know I'm saved. Oh, don't give me that saved business. What's there to be saved from? Well, can't you see that army out there? No, I don't see any army out there. And if there was an army out there, I wouldn't be afraid of it because have you ever seen our walls, Rahab? Have you ever seen our gates and have you ever seen our chariots and our soldiers and our weapons of war? Well, she didn't have any stomach for that because when she heard, she believed and the fear of God came upon her heart and all her courage departed from her and her heart melted and she never trusted a moment after that in the devices of men nor in the fortress of the city. When you believe God, you just suddenly lose all confidence in the flesh. <coughs> and she preaches. And her family finally heard her. And they came in and they gathered with her in that house. And they had nothing for security and nothing for assurance. And nothing to keep them in peace with this one thing, that rope hanging there, saying not a word, yet it was preaching the gospel to all of Jericho. She didn't care who saw it and she didn't care to explain it. For she believed what these messengers said. So she preached. And they came into her household. And the fall came. And the fall is going to come one of these days. Joshua himself is going to appear in our Jericho. And he's going to bring with him the people of God. And those who have the scarlet line. And the scarlet line runs from Genesis to Revelation in the Word of God and is the story of Jesus' redeeming blood, His sacrifice, and His redemption at the cross of Calvary. I'll tell you who's going to go up when Jesus appears. Those who have as their assurance the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Nothing less. You know there's a little part there that just blesses my soul. But just before Joshua appeared, or just as he appeared, in the destruction of the city, he gave those two spies the privilege of going back to Rahab's house to get Rahab and her family. I think it was only fitting and proper that they should go. They had pledged not their word, they pledged Joshua's word. Don't you think it was a great blessing for them to be privileged to accompany Rahab and her family to the presence of Joshua? For well, they brought them into the presence of Joshua and presented them to him as a gift of love from the condemned city of Fortress. <coughs> I think that's going to be our privilege someday, brethren, to bring into the presence of Jesus and to be in the presence of Jesus with those who have been brought to Jesus through our witness and testimony, our message, our ministry. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about every minister of reconciliation here, every ambassador for Jesus Christ here. I know it must be true, Paul said of the, of the Philippians. He said, aren't you my joy? Aren't you my crown in the presence of the Lord Jesus? Won't it be a privilege? Let me go after him, Joshua. He says, go get him and tell him I'm here. And tell him they're saved just like you told them I would save them. Well, they knew that long before they got there. They had the cord. They had the thread. They had the token. They had the assurance. The spies were gone. They didn't worry about whether they had understood them or misunderstood them. They had the cord. Their faith was now in this token, in this symbol. That faith of the Christian is now in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. We can't see it. We know it's there. It's on the mercy seat. And that's our assurance that when Joshua comes, nothing's going to happen to us. There is no judgment, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is the message of God. Okay, I've got to quit because I'm never going to get done if I don't. Close with one thing. It says in the book of Joshua that she dwells in Israel yet. And I believe that literally. I believe she dwells in Israel yet. And apparently she became a very lustrous woman in the history of Israel. And I don't imagine she ever tired of giving her testimony. <coughs> I always think about what she might have said. And I was thinking about this morning. And I imagine when they were all sitting around later sometime, maybe discussing the fall of Jericho, 
Somebody said, uh, Rahab, how'd you get saved? Rahab says, well, I tell you, I built me a ladder, rung at a time, and I clean escaped from the city all by my own works. Now, she's not going to say that. She's going to say, let me tell you, you talk about grace, let me tell you something. Do you know who I am? I'm Rahab. And until I met Jesus, I was nothing but a tramp. I lived on the wall of that fortress. I sold my body to every man that came along for money. I lived in the land of the traffickers. And traffic was my business. I was a harlot. I was a sinner. Oh, the men laughed and made fun of me. But many a night I was lonely and I was afraid. And I knew there had to be something better than this inn on the wall and this kind of life that I lived. And I believed in the Lord God who created the heavens and the earth. And then I heard that this Lord God had come to earth and had called out a people for his name and had led them out of bondage. And he'd rolled back the Red Sea and dealt with the enemies in the land. And I believed that this Lord God who came and called himself Jehovah could save me. And I often wondered how. And one night, in the normal course of affairs, I'm going to tell it like I think it happened. And if you don't like it, you make up your own story. In the normal course of affairs, as I walked the streets of Jericho, I lured a couple of young men to my place. And I thank God for the night that those two men came to my place. They weren't there an hour before I knew that they were not like any other men that had ever been to my place. Oh, I wish I could tell you everything that's on my heart, but I think somewhere out there there's women that need to know that Christian men may not be just like every other man that comes down the pipe. And I hear Rahab say, I'll never forget those men. There's something about them. They came in and they sat down to the table to eat, and the more they talked, the more I was aware that there was something about these men not like any Canaanites that ever came here. They dealt with me in kindness, but in truth. And they said, we didn't come here to preach ourselves. We came to tell you about Joshua. Do you know who Joshua is? And then they told them about Joshua. And she asked him how to be saved. And in giving her testimony, I'm sure she said, I thank God for Joshua and I thank God for the two men he sent. And I thank God that they led me to Jesus and saved me from Jericho and transformed my life and made me a part of the family of God and gave me prophets and priests for my inheritance. And Jesus himself was not ashamed to own me in his own ancestry. That's salvation by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this gospel. It is indeed good news, but it is only good news to sinners. It can't be good news to anyone else. Only the sinner that believes it will ever find cause to rejoice in this gospel. Thank you for Jesus, the friend of sinners. For had he not loved and befriended sinners, I would be lost yet this morning. Had he not been willing to brave the bad reputation of Jericho to send a couple of witnesses after me I wouldn't be here yet and I thank you that nothing can keep him from reaching us if we want to be reached we thank you that his love <coughs> overlooks all obstacles and barriers and sets himself upon the sinner because he died for us and he lives even now to save us so bless this message to whatever use you intended it to accomplish, especially in the life of the unsaved. Oh, Father, there's, there's young men and women in this assembly who need to hear this message and who need to believe it. There are those, Father, perhaps among the older who are lost and just as much a prostitute, and though they may not have prostituted their bodies, but 
spiritually we are unclean and separated from you, Father, and we need to be drawn near to you by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. And for someone here this morning unsaved, Father, we pray that you'd make their hearts to melt and courage to flee from them and bow before Jehovah and the Lord God and turn to Joshua to be saved. And Father, thank you for encouraging the hearts of the Christians and giving us a new compassion for the unsaved. Help us to walk the streets of Jericho looking for a Rahab or her family or whoever who's in that place of condemnation and who longs to know how to be delivered in the hour of need. Thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.